Hi, this is John Pacini from Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, and this is Heart Rhythm TV. We're very excited today to be able to talk with Professor O'Cooley, uh, who just presented results at the American College of Cardiology scientific sessions on outcomes following left atrial appendage occlusion procedures and the impact of leak on outcomes. Um, Dr. O'Cooley, it's a great study. It addresses a really important problem that we see commonly in clinical practice. Um, can you elaborate on what motivated you guys to do the analysis? And Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, as you know, leaks are not uncommon in practice. Almost like one or five in five or one in four patients end up with some sort of a leak after left atrial appendage closure. And the notion is that leaks that are smaller than five millimeters don't matter. That's the notion. Hence the IFU of the device, that I'm talking about the Watchman 2.5, the first generation device now, tells us that if the leak is less than five, then nothing needs to be done. If it's more than five, then you need to maintain these patients on plug thinner unless the leak closes later on. And really that's not based on a lot of data. So, and the problem with finding data to answer this question is, event rate is small, so you need a whole a large number of patients to address this question. Some data, some studies tried to do that before, a few hundred patients, a thousand patients, no strong association, but again, very small number of events. So it's hard to find, to have the power to determine if there is any association. So that's what really prompted us to do this. We, we have now this great NCDR ACC sponsored registry that includes almost virtually every patient who undergoes the procedure in the country. So we thought, can we leverage that large power of patient cohort to answer this question. That's great, and I'm, I'm dying to jump to the results. Yes, so what, how many patients were included in the analysis over what period of time and what did you guys find? Right. So we finished the analysis uh, about a year ago. So we wanted to include patients who have one year follow-up. So the, the end of the project was 2019. So any patients who underwent LAO between 2016 and 2019 were included. So that gave us about a little over 51,000 patients in the study. And then we stratified them into those who have no leak at all at the 45-day study that we do for, to check for leak. Those who have leaks that are considered for current practice not significant, you know, five millimeters or less. And those who had leaks that more than five millimeters. And, you know, the late bladder group, less than one, more than five millimeters were less than 1%, as you can imagine, not common. 75% uh, almost of patients had almost complete closure, so no leaks were reported on the study, in the study. But one in four, almost 25% of patients had a leak that was classified as small, between above zero and five or less millimeters. So the primary endpoint was one year incidence of thromboembolic events, just the hypothesis, right? That does this lead to thromboembolic events for incomplete, because of incomplete closure? So we combined stroke, TIA, and systemic embolization. And there was a 15% higher adjusted rate of thromboembolic event at one year in the small leak cohort. Surprisingly, the large leak cohort didn't have higher events. However, those patients were maintained on blood thinners as per current practice. So it's hard, it's not a randomized trial, right? We cannot tell them, take them off the blood thinner to see the outcomes. So, so the, main, the main highlight is small leaks actually did matter. They were associated with a 15% higher rate of thromboembolic events. Great, so the 50% relative risk reduction, uh, relative risk increase, what was the absolute risk for those exactly. patients so with a small leak? Exactly, so that's very important, you know, when we talk about stroke prevention in general, people are alarmed by, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, but if you look at the absolute rates, that was my next slide actually in the presentation, is cumulative incidence rate was three versus 3.5% at one year. So, so the absolute rate is half a percent. The relative rate increase is 15, not 50, 15 percent. So the absolute rate is small. So it's it's kind of reassuring in that sense too that the, this is a high risk cohort patient. Chad Vask average is four and a half, and we're talking about less than four percent across the board. Very reassuring, uh, I, I would say. I'm going to put you on the spot in front of the Heart Rhythm TV community here and the whole Heart Rhythm community. So based upon what you've learned from this really important analysis. Is our cutoff for leak right? And I recognize that this is a different device and now we're implanting Watchman Flex, but 
Is it three? Is it five? Is it something else? What can you share you with know, us? I, I researched the average diameter of the middle cerebral artery, and it's between two and a half and three millimeters, right? So a three millimeter clot will lead to a major stroke. So if, if the hypothesis is that lat leak is associated with, with this thrombus that can move to the brain, then, you know, hypothetically, even smaller ones would matter. I think we should take away from this that any leak is important and we should really try to leverage all of the newer technology as you said we have second generation devices now we have better planning tool free CT scans right we have you could even do a virtual implant and determine if you're gonna have a leak or not and we also have steerable sheaths so leverage all of that to try to minimize the leak as much as possible and then you know we're gonna end up with a few patients because of remodeling and other issues that will have some leak. So study those prospectively. Should we keep them on plug center for a few months? Some of the leaks would close later on, right? We should study that prospectively. I wouldn't advocate for jumping to closing any leak. I think that is not studied enough and the leak closure by itself has implications and risks. This is a preventative procedure, as you know, with the low absolute rates of events. So we should master it at, at the entry level, not try to mitigate the problems later on. I think that's a great perspective. Um, again, an incredible study. For, for those um, physicians who are implanting this device and managing them in clinical follow-up, could you just summarize what you feel are the top three takeaways from this study? Right, so using first generation devices, leaks were common. One in four patients had some sort of a leak. Hopefully we know from the newer generation devices that's not the case, that's less. Nonetheless, it's not uncommon. That's one. Second take is what we had considered previously small leak may not be not meaningful, may be clinically impactful and we should, we should really try to mitigate even those small leaks. Yet, I think how to do that besides prevention, I mean, obviously an ounce of prevention is better than a whole lot of cure, but uh, we should also try to study prospectively those patients who are left with a little bit of leak, how to manage them properly. Well, there you have it uh, from Dr. Okuli uh, and his analysis in the NCDR registry. Uh, we want to do everything we can to avoid leaks, large and small. And uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing your expertise with the Heart Rhythm thank TV you. community. It's my honor. Thank you very much.